Good evening, this is What's Going On, I'm John Lee. Our guest this evening is Rob Davis. He's a candidate for the Davis City Council. Rob, I wanna thank you for being on our yeah, show. Yeah, thanks for having me, John, I really appreciate it. For sure. Just so you know, I'm gonna do this live so you understand what we're laughing about. <laughs> I've got two day quill here, I'm in the middle of a cold, so I'm gonna <laughs> take my day quill. <laughs> I was going to do that two minutes ago. I'm sorry, but I didn't beat the clock. So you're running for city council. Why are you running for city council? Yeah, well, good question. I guess that's what everyone wants to know. What would, uh, in the midst of the challenges that we're facing as a city, what compels someone to run or encourages someone to run? I, I think for me, you know, as I think about it, there are two linked ideas that always come forward in my mind when, when people ask me that question. One is I think any city uh, is, is constantly in a process of, of defining uh, its vision of what it wants to be. And of course that vision means things like we wanna, we wanna be able to live here in this place securely for a long time. We want a healthy population, not just today, but we wanna have in place the things that will keep us healthy tomorrow, whether it's economically healthy, whether it's socially healthy, strong, vibrant, or environmentally. We need to live in this place. This is more than just a space on the planet. This is home. And so to achieve that, you know, it may be even unstated goal of long-term sustainability, me and my children and other generations that come after, we need a vision. You know, we need to constantly reform that vision. And I think a city council member, I mean, the first concept is and why I want to run is because I think a, a city council member helps um, helps articulate that vision. City council member is not responsible for articulating it, but, but enabling, I use the concept of you know, the midwife, of helping to birth a vision. And, and I think that that's a, that's a process that doesn't begin and end, um, you know, obviously over a four year period. It, it's throughout that process, it's listening. It's, it's understanding where things need to change and not being afraid to then, you know, once that vision is, is articulated, or as it's articulated, I should say, then the second part is, all right, um, we've articulated what we want to be. Now, what do we need to do to get there? What are the day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month, and year-to-year decisions that we need to make to keep us economically, environmentally, and social, socially healthy? And so I don't, I don't think the two can be separated. I think an ongoing uh, attempt to articulate and refine a vision for our city is one. And I, I, I'm, I, I think I'm good at that and want to be part of that, I'm, you know, because I, I think I'm good at it because I've had a lot of experience around the world sitting in communities with community members from a variety of backgrounds, listening to them talk about the challenges and assets in their community, essentially, and then using that to forge a way forward. I've done it elsewhere, and I think I can help to do it here. And then the day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month, that's the hard decision-making that comes. That, because really, I mean, I, I think it's easier to rally around the vision than to really agree on the means to achieve it. And so I think the other thing is to make the hard decisions so that if we want to go in a direction, we have the resources mobilized and cared for, the investments, I'll use that term, in people and in our you know, in our infrastructure, so that we can continue those things. I, I, look at, I look at my life, and I've been involved in both, not at a government level, but in the organizations I've worked for, in communities uh, that I've worked with in various places around the world. And I, the decision-making, you know, the, the regular decision-making, which is where most of our disagreements lie, um, I, I think that's the hard work of leadership. But it's, it's something that I, I, I want to participate in. I think we're all different. And some of us, when we see challenges and problems, you know, we want to be in there discussing solutions and helping move things forward. And I, that's the kind of person I am. And I look forward to being able to play that role. But you know, not in the absence of, of deep listening, taking into account various views. Because I'm a good listener, because I value the opinions of other people, because I understand there are multiple perspectives in a community. That things that people feel very passionately about, that, that work of even the week to week, month to month, is a, needs to be a very patient, one needs to be very patient and, and focused on the process of allowing that to happen in a transparent way. 
So the things I value, you know, I do value transparency. I do value participation. I do value multiple perspectives. Um, I, I value conflict uh, in the sense that conflict is, to me, a sign that we are, are challenging each other. We're not fully in agreement about how to move forward. But it's not a bad thing if it's used productively. We sharpen each other. We sharpen each other's ideas. We challenge one another. And I want to be part of that challenging, and I want to be challenged. And so those skill sets um, that I've developed, I, I feel confident I can bring to bear on the city, uh, on, you know, to, to, to meet the challenges uh, uh, that our city faces. So, I mean, I, I could talk more about skill sets that I bring, but I mean, those are the two large, you know, sort of perspectives that, that I think lead me to say I want to be, I want to be part of the, the leadership team helping to lead the city uh, over the next four years. Well, I, I, I do want you to talk about your skill sets, and we'll get into that. But I, I think that if we do a little biography, it'll make your skill sets mm -hmm. make a little more sense. So what was it like when you were a little boy? What, <laughs> did, what do you care about? What, what were your values when you were growing up? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it seems like a world away. I grew up in uh, south central Pennsylvania. Um, Used to be called, you know, still called somewhat the Bible Belt of the North. You know, it's a it's a very conservative area. It's the home of the Amish, the Mennonites, uh, who are who are our neighbors. Uh, you know, really a small town guy. I mean, smaller than small town village. Grew up. I mean, I understand, in some sense, more intuitively the rural nature of our region than I do the cities because that's the that's the that's the world I came from. Uh, very much a farming community, but a community that was that was in flux, in the sense that um, demographically, it was experiencing a tremendous amount of growth driven by, you know, its proximity to Philadelphia and major metropolitan area Baltimore, and um, you know that that farmland, uh, as I was growing up, was 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 disappearing. Um, you know, out here we talk about some of the most productive irrigated farmland out there. It's really the some of the most productive productive non-irrigated farmland. Um, so my family was um, conservative uh, in many respects, politically, certainly. Um, I, I often think of, uh, you know, I grew up in the, in the, really, I was a child of the, you know, during the, the civil rights movement. I was eight years old when, when you know, Dr. Martin Luther King was, was killed. And in my family, there were two things, I think, in that era that really that really, that really struck our family and, and changed it fundamentally. One was civil rights. And, um, you know, I love my mom and dad, but, but their whole upbringing and everything and, and our isolation from really any diversity, it was a very white community, um, led to a lot of confusion about what this all meant. And they were quite hostile towards the civil rights movement, I would say. Um, yeah, that's not, an, that's not overstating it. Fear. And so as the country was changing, they were people that <coughs> were fearful of what was embodied in civil rights would mean. The interesting thing is, here I was a little kid, and I, w I loved baseball. I mean, I... That was it. In my town, there was no other sport. We had no swimming pool. We had no tennis courts. We had nothing but a baseball diamond, and we would play while there was snow on the ground. Point is, I idolized, you know, those baseball heroes. And my and I won't get into all the reasons Roberto how this came to be. Clemente. No, it wasn't. He was from Pennsylvania, but actually, I was a St. Louis Cardinals fan. And so, Bob Gibson, oh, the pitcher, pitcher, an amazing pitcher, you know, still has the lowest earned run average in a season of any pitcher in Major League history in 1968. And he pitched complete games. And he pitched complete games. He wrote a book, if you can imagine this. He, you know, when I was a kid, and I think this, you know, book days at school, it was a scholastic book. He wrote a book, and I remember getting it as probably an eight or nine year old. I don't remember exactly. And it was a story about how he had been forced. The great Bob Gibson, when he was in the minor leagues, had been forced to stay in a separate hotel room from his teammates. And I, I just couldn't believe it. And so while my parents were experiencing turmoil, turmoil and doubt about civil rights, I was saying, no, there's injustice. I, I don't think I had that word yet. There is something wrong. 
that this man who is amazing and who I would idolize every afternoon throwing that ball against the barn door, um, how can this be? And it really set my mind to wonder about some of those things. And um, it was a real, it, there was a real disconnect. And I, it wasn't until much later as a teenager that I really challenged my parents about those views. And it wasn't until later still when I was able to travel abroad and really experience immersion in other cultures that I was able to put words to some of the things that I was experiencing. But it was cognitive dissonance, really, and it was difficult. The other thing that I would say about that childhood growing up, and it's much more difficult to talk about even now, is um, you know, is the Vietnam War, and that all of I was I was young, I, you know, I was young, but I was the youngest of a, of, of basically almost the youngest uh, grandchild or child in the you know in that generation, and so all my cousins and my brother, and my future brother-in-law uh, were all off to Vietnam or involved in that war in one way or the other, and came back fundamentally changed, and not for the good. They were traumatized. I think many of them experienced PTSD. Again, who had the language then? But they were violent. Uh, they were disconnected from community. They engaged in a lot of self-destructive behavior. And, and frankly, I was puzzled by that. Um, and so, you know, it's funny. You grew up in a rural, isolated little community in south central Pennsylvania, but the world was crashing in on us as it was, to, I guess, to everybody in our generation. And... Um, it just posed a lot of questions for me. And I think ultimately, it didn't drive me away. I mean, people changed. People in that area have changed quite a bit. I, I still love it there. But I think fundamentally, um, that world pouring in as it was for the TV set and through the marches and through even my sister, who you know was, was arrested uh, at a protest in, uh, I think it was in, in New England. Um, you know, all of a sudden, this little town couldn't contain all of the all of the, sort of the curiosity that I had. I never thought I'd come to California per se. Never thought I'd travel. Never did travel until I was uh, 18 years old. Never got in a plane. But those things, those questions, were there as a result of the world coming in. And um, you know, those the high school years were years of I guess like any high school student even today here in Davis, um, questioning. Questioning authority, that's probably normal, but it was in the context of what felt like pretty convulsive changes. I mean, 68, I wasn't a teenager yet, but 68 around the world was a year of profound change. The invasion of Czechoslovakia, the, the Paris riots, uh, what happened in the US, uh, the various urban uh, riots that were happening, the 68 Democratic Convention. Uh, a lot of violence everywhere, a lot of uh, ferment everywhere. It caused a, a young child and then a teenager to really ask, you know, what, what, what's underlying people's rage and anger? And then beginning to name and understand concepts of injustice and feeling like that was something that I needed to understand better. That's not a full biography, but that was my family. I, my, my mom's gone. My dad's still alive, a very proud World War II um, Navy man. Um, who um, you know, taught me and what I honor him for, though I disagree with him so much on his politics, is just the, you know, the value of honesty and, te and integrity. He, 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 he is a man of integrity. And I, and I, I've, you know, I, I think I, I really aspire. He was a man of his word. And a man who, uh, with all his faults, is able to, is able to maintain that sense of, of, uh, of rightness and commitment. Uh, to my mom for over 50 years, and then to our community where he was uh, an informal leader. Uh, left quite a mark on me, certainly. So college. Well, I don't talk too much about that, although it's where I met my wife, and we've been married for 32 years now. Um, it was, it was, it, it's, it's hard to talk about it in the sense that it is a very different life. We, we grew up in fundamentalist Christian families. Uh, both of us, and met at a, at a very, very conservative uh, Christian college, which academically was quite good, but um, in terms of our own views of the world and, um, and faith, um, you know, I'll just leave it to say we're not, we're not there anymore. What I learned You've in college, evolved. Well, I think we all have, uh, yeah. Uh, evolved, maybe, um, transformed, maybe, um, I mean, I think you know the, the the responses that were the answers that were given us to the big questions by that upbringing, you know, couldn't be they couldn't hold, those answers couldn't hold up as soon as you step outside that very narrow culture. 
And, and don't get me wrong, I respect, again, a lot of the people that were there in those places. I mean, these were my teachers. These were my neighbors. I don't disrespect them, but, you know, once when you travel around outside of, you know, your, your, that, that, that kind of bubble uh, into the broader world, and, and then internationally, which we've done a lot. I mean, you know, I've been to 30 or almost 40 different countries. The answers that are given in that context growing up just don't fit anymore. Um, people believe other things. And, and people are wonderful despite that they're not like you. <laughs> and that they were considered to be bad people by the standards of how you were brought up. And all of a sudden you find, I mean, you know, you know, it's interesting. I've I've done a lot of work in Islamic countries, and you know, I mean, even I think more so now than than a few years ago. You know, con the word Islam raises I think fear in people's mind because of what's happened. And yet, where have I experienced the the greatest depth of hospitality is probably in Peshawar, you know, Pakistan. Cool. Um, where have I experienced it again is is you know in in Afghanistan. Uh, as I was there, I can remember getting lost on the streets and being led home by the arm by, by well-meaning people. That fundamentally changes your understanding of, you know, of people. And that was the process from, you know, basically college onward was seeing the world, um, just seeing the world and as a result of seeing it, realizing that people uh, are, do amazing things, are capable of amazing things, show wonderful hospitality, welcome the stranger. And what it makes you want to do is it makes you want to bring that beautiful thing you see in cultures, which is somewhat absent here. I wouldn't say we're a culture known for our hospitality uh, here in the US or uh, necessarily, but it makes you want to bring the best of that home and make, you know, make your home and make your community a welcoming place and make it a place that, that values you know, the stranger and values the person who lives on the edge. This is what I learned, what I've learned in many cultures and many places around the world. And I'm, I'm, I think I'm a better person for it. Well, that sounds like a segue to what your work is and how you got involved in that. Well, I mean, the work of the, the, the traveling overseas was never, you know, touristic traveling. It was, it was for work in maternal and child health primarily. Um, and, and that work, you know, took me into communities, um, you know, from Haiti to um, Mali, Mauritania. I, I won't even cite all the countries in West Africa. I've been to Ghana. I've already mentioned Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Philippines. Um, and typically in each of those places, you know, it would be uh, more, I, I worked largely in more rural areas again, uh, which, which uh, is where poverty is, is, you know, we often talk about going that last mile, you know, dealing with poverty on the last mile or dealing with that public health challenge out there at the last mile being the most expensive, the most costly because these are the people that are most, you know, um, marginalized both geographically and, and economically and socially. And it's really true, um, and it is costly. And so my work took me, um, not always by choice, uh, into those areas where I saw people not only surviving in very difficult situations, but thriving. What we were bringing uh, really was um, you know, some uh, information, some technology that could help improve the health of children. Uh, basic things, some education, a lot of dialogue. Um, and it's funny, I, 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 was, I was thinking about, you know, I was th I've been thinking about this in relation to Davis, um, most especially because, you know, I, I really do feel that the health of our city is, a, is, 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 is somehow emerging of, this, of the social, the economic, the environmental. And I know there's a tendency you know, we're in this fiscal, you know, very fis dif difficult fiscal situation now here in Davis, which, which we should probably talk about a little bit more. But um, there's a tendency to say, you know what, Let, we need to get our economic house in order. And then we can deal with the social challenges, whether it's homelessness or addiction. You know, you got to have money to do those things. My experience in Africa is actually just the opposite of that. Uh, I can remember... I could give many anecdotes. One that, that sticks in my mind is the very first time I went to Mauritania, I was, on, I was with a team traveling up, into the, up onto the very edge of the desert where villages were literally disappearing. Um, sand dunes were moving in, and uh, it was a severe drought. We were at the tail end of a very severe drought. Um, 
that had really destroyed the livelihoods of a lot of people. And, and we were going around doing health assessments in communities and actually doing some basic census work to see who was left. And I can remember going into a community, I mean, it's kind of hard to describe it. You, you would, you, if you arrived there, you would say, how do people survive here? There was no apparent water source. People were living in tents. Anyway, the children in that community were amazingly healthy. We were weighing them, and they were amazingly healthy. And when we arrived in the village, I remember the, one of the leaders of the village approaching our vehicle and saying, whatever you bring for us, make sure you take and go, go and see the children first. What he, was, what he was doing, he was making a statement about the, go, go and see the most vulnerable first. And uh, I had been to other communities where I had arrived and heard leaders say, what did you bring us? Tell me what you brought us. Tell me what you brought me. In fact, in that, on that very day, I had been to a village like that, and many of the children had been sick. And in this village and in others where I was, but on that same day where the, where the village leader came out and said, go first to the children, the children were all doing relatively well. And it showed me, with, it, it showed me that what matters is the commitments we make. Later, when I was doing research in that in an area not too far from there, I remember I used to do these simple little pile sorts. We would put a pile of stones or something like that on the ground, and we would ask the people in the community to sort it out, sort it out by the relative size of different groups in terms of their well-being. Bam, do it in a hurry. People know their communities in these small towns. You know, the, this number sure. of people is, you know, is well off, and this people is okay, and then these people, you know, are not doing well, and then they'd have this other group. And I remember in Mauritania they'd say, "Maindoshi," they don't have anything. And it was typically it was typically um, widows and orphans, and I can remember them talking very clearly and cogently about what the community did to make sure that these people were taken care of. Because ma'indoshi, they have nothing, but they have us. The point being, as I look at the challenges when of Davis. When you're done, I want to add to that. Sure. Well, no, I just want to bring it back to Davis. Because we can't, you know, the social challenges we face, whether it's addiction or homelessness or, or um, you know, I'm thinking of, 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 of foster services, where people are really, you know, sometimes coming out of those programs hurting, directionless, whatever it might be. We, we can't wait. We don't have to wait. We can make commitments, and we can follow through even though our resources are limited. And um, I don't even know how I got off on that, but it, it really I, matters I to me. I want to add to it. Okay, so, go ahead. <laughs> so um, this is historic. Abraham Maslow, the guy who invented self-actualization in the hierarchy, the hierarchy of needs. needs. Yeah. In the early 1930s, um, was in this group with Ruth Benedict, the cultural anthropologist, and she said, you know, Abe, all the people you've been working with have been Jewish urban people just like yourself. So you don't know anything about cross-culturally how valid your psychological analysis really are. So Abe went with uh, a couple who became a couple and got married and had a kid. So uh, up to Saskatchewan to an Indian territory and it had a panhandle and at the end of the panhandle was a poor white town. Well, these people in the 1940s, in the middle of World War II, and were Indians, were all self-actualized. And Abe's going, wait a minute, maybe 5% of the people being self-actualized, but not 95% of the people. Not everybody living up to their full potential. And so he said, OK, what's going on here? What's different? And he identified two things. And the second one related directly to what you were saying. I'm going to tell you the other one first, though. And the, the other one was, kids 18 months old, 12 months old, 13, 18, can walk. They come to the door. They want to go, you know, it's clear to everybody in the room. They want to go through the door, and they want to get in the next room. Polite white people, what we do is we go, oh, you want to go in the room? You open the door for them, and they walk through. Now, that's, that's if you're nice, OK? Other people <laughs> just ignore the kids. What happens in their culture is all the adults stand around and watch the kid. The kid opens the door by himself, and then the, the adults all applaud. Mm. So from the very earliest age, the kids get recognition and stature for accomplishment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the other thing was in September in Canada, is real close to winter. Yeah. And what happens is they put 
everything they're willing to give away on their blanket in the quad in the center of, mm. of the community. And if you ask everybody in the community who the richest person in the community was, they'd all point to the same 30-year-old guy who was single, who put everything he had on the blanket because he knew whatever that they left for him would be more than enough mm -hmm. to give him through the winter. But they also knew that if he came to their house, they'd be more than happy to give him a meal or a place right, to stay right, for right, the night. Right. So it's very reciprocal. Yeah, but the idea is to hold up the bottom. Yeah. Well, and that's right. And I, that's, I'm really, I, I like that story. Look, it, I'm not, I'm not advocating some sort of, Vague, I, I don't know what people hear when they hear stories like this. What I want to point out, though, is that the learnings that I've had around the world show me what can be done, even in dire situations, even in difficult situations, if we're intentional. If we're intentional about holding up our values. If, if we're intentional about um, commitments to strong community. And, and, and I think that's a word that I really want to, I really want to, I want to say a lot, and I want to use a lot, and I want to mean intentional. You know, so many of the decisions, you know, that whole vision process, so much of, of bringing it to fruition is then being intentional about following through on commitments. It's being intentional about making sure that, you know, our financial system enables us to get to the point we want and, and to be honest when we're not getting there, for example, to be intentional about meeting the needs of, of those in our community who are struggling and, um, and not waiting until we have everything in order uh, in order to be able to bring, you know, to do the other things that we want to do, but moving forward to, you know, not, we, you know, we need, to, we need to take steps to reduce our carbon footprint now, not when it becomes economically convenient to do so. It's not going to ever be. It's never going to be. And, and, you know, that's the point. I mean, it, it, you know, anywhere I've been in the world, there's never really a good time to deal with the marginalized. I mean, it's always hard work, especially if mental health issues are involved. Um, it's never going to be easy. We're never going to have enough wealth to do it well. We're never going to have all the exact right policies in place. It takes a community to look out for those who are struggling with those issues. And, and, and I've seen that and I've experienced that. And I, I think part of leadership in this context is being able to not design all the programs, but to nurture the willingness of community members to step forward, to volunteer, to give of themselves. And we have in Davis, you know, a human resource potential and capacity that is just, you know, I've said it before, it's, it, it's unmatched in many of the places that I've seen, and a willingness to step up and be part of solving problems. Outside of government structures, this all, this all does not have to flow through a government format. I mean, I think, I think the state and, and the local government in, in terms of a city council sometimes needs to be a facilitator of it, sometimes needs to encourage it and be a cheerleader, and sometimes just needs to step back and let the wonderful things that people are willing to do happen for the betterment of the city. And I think we can do that. I mean, I, I don't think that that's not happening, but I, I think there's more maybe we can do to nurture it. There's more encouragement we can give to it. I mean... Um, I could give examples of that. Um, even today, I was mentioning to you before we came on. You know, a group of us received the recognition from the from the supervisors for work we've done on neighborhood court. I was only one of several, but you know, the people that were there, we we sat, stood around and talked about it. No one was no one's paid us a dime to do any of this. We've put in many long hours, uh, others far more than me, and you know, it went a long way. To be able to stand next to the supervisors with um, those involved from the district attorney and to receive a thank you. You know, that gives you a lot of encouragement to say, yeah, this, this does matter. Yeah, this is hard work. Sometimes we get in the throes of it. It doesn't seem like we're making progress. But a little bit of recognition, a little bit of encouragement, a little bit of saying, you know, we need this to happen. We need what you guys are doing to continue. We need your volunteerism can be a huge spark to continuing it. And I think electeds, you know, elected officials can, can do that. I, I want to do that. That's not the full answer. I'm not claiming it is. Um, but, but it's a piece of what we're going to continue to need to evolve and be as a city, as our resources are constrained, as we live in a context statewide and even nationally that just can't seem to move beyond some of the fiscal uh, imbalances that, that we've experienced. Though things are growing again, as we, we still continue to face challenges, especially at the city level, we're going to have to evolve many more ways of meeting our needs and become, I think, and we'll become a, a, a more resilient city as a result. 
Well, you've walked up to all the fiscal issues that the city is confronted with. Why don't you lay out the fiscal map as you see it? Well, it's the it, financial problems confronting the city. Yeah, I, I mean, the bottom line, you know, I mean, quite simply, and people can can go to the to the city council website and look. I think it was December seventeenth. Go and look at the uh, presentation done by the city manager. You know, any a, a city in California, I guess anywhere. Um, you know, we can we can run an annual deficit if if we have reserves. If we if our fund balances are positive in a given year, it's not. It's not unthinkable that you may have an, a negative balance for that year. We're kind of moving into a new world where our balances will be depleted. We, I mean, we're, we're probably going to end this fiscal year, FY 13-14 and June 30th, with a fiscal balance of probably, again, these things change, but it's projected about $3.6 million dollars. Our, on how large a budget? We're talk, that's in our general fund, and that would be expenditures in the realm of we must be approaching or just over forty million. Okay, so, so three million th over yeah over forty. But our our structural imbalance next year will actually turn that positive figure negative, and if we don't do anything, we will see the year to year and the years after that we're facing five million dollar annual, annual structural imbalances. Not cumulative, but each year, five million additional. Now, something will have to give. Something will have to give. What's driving that? What's driving it is really four things. And some of it we don't control uh, at this point in history. Uh, what's driving it? Well, some of it is decisions we've made about water. Uh, the city has to purchase its water, and water bills are going up. And the city's water bills are going to go up. So we need to conserve. But even if we conserve, bills are still going to go up. Other three are related to employee compensation. Retirement, uh, medical for those who are in our system now and those who are already retired, and then cafeteria plan, which is payout um, to people if they opt out of the medical care. Those are the four major drivers that are driving that $5 million. Uh, structural imbalance that would balloon out, you know, if we didn't do anything about it, would lead to a deficit of 28 million over the next five years. We, we can't have that. We can't do that. And what we have is we have a trajectory, and I think people understand compounding of rates, but we have, you know, we have a rate of growth of expenditure because of those drivers that is outstripping the rate of growth of our revenue at this uh, growth at this time. So those imbalances have to be dealt with. They, they, they have to be dealt with. They're actually worse than what I just said, though. And, and I think that is what makes it really difficult to talk about this, because not fully accounted for in that 5 million or more annual uh, structural imbalance is, uh, is a backlog of infrastructure repair, primarily roads. Now. We have a situation now where our roads are deteriorating. We've done a pavement condition index analysis, had it done by professionals, verified by University of California Davis professor. Um, you know, we're, we have some streets that are failing. And of course, the longer you leave a street, the more expensive it is to fix it. And so we have an interest in, in sort of upfront, front end loading repairs on those streets. But this is a process that's going to need to go on for some years. But the, the, the structural imbalance that I laid out there does not allow us to maintain or improve the condition of our streets. In fact, our streets will deteriorate further. We probably need an additional, and the numbers vary, and I probably don't have them exactly right. I, I could look them up, but probably an additional maybe five to seven million a year to keep our pavement in condition so that um, you know, we, can, we can use them and, and that we're not facing increased costs of repair. Well, you can see, and then, and then there may be other infrastructure upkeep on parks and city buildings that are not included in that, and I don't even have figures for it at this point. Point is, that's a lot of money. Um, and, you know, a city's budget is not, you know, we, a lot of people look at national budget and, and see, the, you know, the U.S. government running deficits year after year and having a large debt. And, of course, you can do that if you're, if you, if you're able to control your money supply, but the, the, a city doesn't do that, obviously. And so our budget here is much more similar to a household budget 
we got to make ends meet. Uh, you can't bar your way out of it. And cities have uh, gone bankrupt. And I'm not saying that Davis is, is there. We're certainly not. But it happens, meaning that our situation as a city is not unlike what, what people face in their homes. So you know, what do we do about it? You know, what do we do about it? And you know, I think we'll be hearing more from the city council in the next couple of weeks about what some of the choices are short term. Um, but these gaps are difficult to fill. And there is no magic bullet. You know, there's not one thing that you can say, if we do this, it's going to be a combination of several things. Uh, we will be seeing, I'm, I'm certain, um, proposals for tax increases. Certainly a sales tax increase. Our current sales tax is at 8%. We keep, uh, we keep a penny and a half of every dollar based on that here. I think there'll be a proposal to increase that to 8.5%. Other cities have that? Yeah. It's, it, it would take us to about probably near the mean for California. Woodland, Woodland's Sacramento. At uh, Woodland's at 8.25. Sacramento, I'm not sure where they are. I think they might be at 8.5. Um, and I think that's a recent change. In any case... If we increase that much, and again, you know, sales tax is always tricky, you know, when you, when you project out what it's going to yield. Um, but, I mean, the projections the city's doing right now is I could yield an extra $3.6 million. That doesn't get a, Remember the figures that I had Five. out earlier. Five plus. Five plus. There's also, and, and this is not something that, that uh, is, is, is any way in secret, is, is secret. It was in the, man, again, it was in the city manager's report, um, an additional parcel tax. Um, I mean, taxes will go on the ballot. You know, any tax, uh, sales tax is considered a general tax because it's not used, it's, it's not earmarked, it's not specified for any use, requires a majority plus one, must be on the same ballot as the city council. You know, my, my own view would be if, if, if that's going to be a solution, it should be very time limited. Um, it, we should, you know, to build accountability about how the money's used to assure that it's used effectively. A parcel tax, I'm not sure what the plan for that is. That could raise, depending how it's structured, could raise an additional $3 million. Um, so you start to see what some of the potential is. But again, keep in mind that even if we're meeting, you know, uh, that uh, filling that structural imbalance in a year, there's two other factors going on. One is the continued backlog of streets, which needs to be factored in. And the other is the continued disparity between the growth rates of revenue and expenses. Because even if we increase, you know, those, those, those taxes um, and sales tax, sales can increase as the economy improves, but will it catch up to the trajectory of expenses? I, I don't know. I'm doubtful. So we're in a situation where, you know, taxes. A lot of people will talk, and, and should, we should talk, about, you know, it's, you know it's, br it's a broad concept that, well, one of the ways that we face this over the longer term is through economic development. I'm sure glad you're running this interview. So thank you for segueing to the next question. <laughs> well, Okay. No, good, 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 good. Thank you. Well, we're, we're talking about solutions now because, no, you know, we're not going to sit. You couldn't have done a better job of reading my mind, Rob. That's all. Well, I think, I think when people hear, I think, first of all, I don't think that we do a good job here defining what we mean by economic development. And I think it's a, it's a scary word. So I think we should start by saying what economic development is not. Right? Economic development is not building new homes on the periphery of Davis. Um, you know, housing complexes over a relatively short period of time become a net drain on the city because you still have to provide services and the fees and things that are front end loaded. I, the number I heard was four hundred fifty thousand dollars for a house. If you pay more than that, then your property tax revenues come close to compensating for the services well, you will be receiving. Well, I would encourage people, and you can find it online, to go and look at the projections that were made for Cannery, the newest uh -huh, project that's uh -huh. going in. And there will be units up there that will surpass that. Um, but that's the at analysis. The outset. Well, that's the point. Yeah, I haven't actually heard it put that way. But what I can tell you is the analysis, the fiscal model that was used, shows that not the cumulative uh, benefit to the city, to the general fund of Cannery, but the year on year after about year 10 turns negative. Um, and, and again, that's related to cost escalation, the pr provision of services, uh, pr you know, city staff, compensation, all of those things grows faster than the revenue generated by property and other taxes there. So 
Economic development is not that, though. Economic development it does not mean homes. It, 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 and it really, and, and, and other people say, well, economic development then is, is building business parks, you know, again, on the periphery. And people are fearful of, of that and the issue of sprawl, of course. Um, but, you know, that's not all that economic development is. There, there, there is an innovation task force now uh, that's been put together by the city uh, that has been exploring sites around the city where an innovation park could be. I've been asking for, you know, even back of the envelope figures about what revenue streams can typically come from a place like that. They're the advantage, of course, of, of business as you, you get jobs. You have multiplier effects. Um, and so, you know, those uh, that work, of course, get an income and can spend that on goods, hopefully in the city, and that generates sales tax. Good. That's part of the multiplier. But you also have um, property tax from that, and you have non-secured property. So if you have a, a business like a robotics company that needs to buy new equipment, that's all taxable, and that flows into the some of that flows into the city's coffers. But the other thing about economic development, and, and, but that doesn't equal economic development. Economic development is, is, is more than just business parks. And, and if we're going to have them, I would say I'm willing to examine uh, the possibilities, obviously, on you know, lower productive farmland um, or land that is just not suitable for farming, like Nishi is not really suitable, uh, some of the land west of the hospital, or land that is protected in a way so that it's not going to lead to sprawl. I think we have some opportunities there, and I'd like to look at them. But I think we, we, need, we need some ballpark numbers to see what are the revenue streams that that activity will yield. But beyond all that, I mean, I think there's so much we can do within our, with, with what we already have in our downtown to make it a place that, it, we, you know, people, we talk about densification of our downtown, and what that means is, it means more properties where people can live, where more businesses can get established. And, and in a revenue sense, uh, it means more property tax as you redevelop. But we live in a post-redevelopment agency world. And so there's not a lot of money lying around on the floor that we can put towards redevelopment. So what I want to do, I mean, I certainly, I certainly want to explore you know, what you can, the, the, the array of things that we can do to densify our downtown to bring in more retail into that space, to bring in more, you know, therefore tax revenue into that space, more property tax through redevelopment and densification, meaning building higher. Um, you know, how we can use it to attract, attract more people to come to our community to enjoy our entertainment, our food. I mean, these are things that we need to make investments in because they will generate streams. So all of those things can be a piece of economic development. The, the thing that I want to make sure I'm communicating is that the, the tension, the fear that people have about that turning into some sort of free-for-all sprawl, I'm, I'm cognizant of that concern. And so the, the tension that I live with is that I'm also committed to preserving our peripheral farmland. Why? Because it's a resource for our future, just like all the other things in our city are a resource for our future. And so I want I, I am not for a free-for-all. I'm for intentionality about saying, where are our best options? How do we link to the greatest one of the greatest resources we have here, the university, to enhance our relationship and build on the great research work that's going there, bring it into a business, you know, uh, business development within our city so that we're actually creating linkages with that resource, and we're actually building businesses that meet the needs of the periphery that is the farmland around us, for an example. So how can we, I don't know, I don't, know, I don't have a magic wand, but I, I want to be clear that when I talk about, and I'm willing to talk about economic development as a piece of how we begin to grow the revenue we need to live here, how do we make it, how do we do it in a way that's consistent with who we are, that preserves precious farmland, that builds on the strengths of the university, that meets the needs of our local watershed, farmers, ag, maybe not just here, but further out, but begins here, and, and provides good, meaningful jobs for young people in our community. So I think all of those things are part of the solution. And that's why I say, if you're looking for a magic bullet, we're not going to find it. There is going to be some tax increase. Uh, that's what we need in the short run. But I think what we need is we need city council that's going to really lay out some clear goals, not just write them on a piece of paper and put them away. We have plans out there, but it's going to take the steps to try to move this kind of complex set 
of things together to develop revenue. I will. I know you're looking at the clock. And we need, we, we need no, to move no, on, but let me just. No, please. I, I mean, I think it's more difficult, and I, I actually hesitate to even bring it up. But you know, I think we have to ask the question on the on the cost side: Is there more that we can do? And I've been everything I've been talking about is revenue, but there is that cost side. Now, the bottom line is: I think if you talk to most people in city government, I mean, we've we've reduced our city staffing over the last five years by 100 positions, 22 percent. And so, you know, right off the top, it seems like we've cut to the bone. We cut any more, what services are we going to lose? But I think we have to ask, is it possible? Are there things we can do? You know, our employee compensation is a significant part of, uh, of, of the challenge. Um, can we simultaneously communicate to our city staff that we think you're fantastic, we value the, your work, but we need you to help us hold the line on, on growth of expenditures. How do we do that? How do I sit with a city employee and have that conversation? That's a hard one. But I'd be lying to say that I didn't think that, that city council needs to be willing to, to go in that direction. Right. I don't want to. I, 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 think it, I think it's very hard to send a consistent message of valuing people while you say, you know, we're going to have to hold the line on your salary. We're going to have to reduce. You know, we're going to have to um, cut back. But I want everything to be on the table. Yep. Well, you know, we're, we're still a part of uh, town of Democrats and pretty labor friendly. So when uh, people have been elected to the city council in the past, they've been open to what laborers had to say. Well, I, look, I, we have a long history in this country and actually worldwide uh, that shows me the absolute value of organized labor. Absolutely. And, and I don't, you know, I would never want to lose that. And, 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 and organized labor exists to collectively bargain. And I say, yep, great, do it. Lay out your needs. Lay out what, you know, your, the people you're representing need for their families. And then give me the opportunity to lay out my needs too. This is a negotiation. This is bargaining. Yeah. And in the time of fiscal challenge, I think what we need to do is we need to make those discussions respectful. I think we need to be honest. I think it really requires leadership that is seen to be fair and what I mean by that is fair in the sense that they're not throwing money away willy-nilly, but are really focused on the fundamentals, able to pull back and really lay out what is our fundamental core business as a city and make sure we provide those and do not engage in superfluous spending. You know, I think, well, I, I, I won't go in that direction. I, I'll, I'll simply say that I think that's the responsibility the next four years, um, given the realities I laid out, they're not going to be easy times. We're going to have to look at each other in the face and say, you know, how are we going to accomplish this? Um, but I, I, I think, going back, you know, going back to who I am as a person, I, I want to engage in those conversations in a respectful way and acknowledge that I don't have all the answers. And that I don't think anybody does, but together we're going to figure out a way to get this stuff done. We, we don't have a choice. We are going to continue to live here. We're going to continue to host students in this community from all over the planet. We're going to continue to be part of a thriving uh, region, an ag region that is thriving and is doing well. Um, we're going to continue to be part of that, and we're going to continue to move our city forward. But we're going to face hard choices to make that happen. And, and I, do I relish being part of that, relish may not be the right word, but I do think I'm, 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 what I'm doing now, day to day, is preparing myself to be in that place, to be in that role, and to do it faithfully, and with an ear to hearing the concerns that arise as a result of it. So I want to say one more thing about economic development, and then I'd like you to close by talking about leadership. So um, I used to have this joke, and that was um, 10 years ago, the gang of eight, the eight most powerful people in the world were meeting in France. And the French, the uh, Canadian prime minister was bilingual. He was French and English. And President 
W. Bush said to the Canadian, the problem with the French is they don't have a word for entrepreneur. <laughs> now, the obvious joke is entrepreneur That's a, is a, a French, French word. word. <laughs> okay. So, so on the face of it, it's a joke on Bush. <laughs> yeah, it certainly is. <laughs> but I've been, I've been thinking about it, and I've been thinking, you know, the, the French economy is the most socialist in the negative sense, economy in the world. They have 54, I don't know about the, the Chinese and the Russians, I'm not going there. <laughs> among, among industrial Western nations, the French economy is 54% public sector. So the reality is, is the French have lost the idea of entrepreneurship. Now, that's one insight. The second insight is the way I can remember how to spell it is that it's E-E-E-U. <laughs> so it's entrepreneur. <laughs> and, and so the way I translated it this morning and thinking about this conversation was put an M in front of each of those vowels for the beginning, and then it's entrepreneur is me, 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 <laughs> for you. <laughs> and so the, the point is when somebody goes into a business, they're making a tremendous investment in the future. They're ecologists. They care about the potential of the environment because they want it to be healthy and sustainable in the future for their good. Sure. They're, they're making an investment. Yeah. Uh, well, let, me, let me pick up on that because it's something that I want to say. I mean, I think we can get into these dichotomies, you know, that, that entrepreneurs or business people, you know, are, are selfish and self-centered. I, I don't know. I hear these kind of things. I, I, there's a couple things that I, I, I observe. I look at our downtown businesses, and I know some of the business people down there pretty well, partly because I use the downtown frequently. Um, you know, I'm struck by a couple things. One thing I'm struck by how often members of our community approach those businesses in the downtown and elsewhere and request support for private activities. And community good. Yeah. And community events. And, 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 and how much, and look at the paper, you know, uh, when people are giving thanks, how many of our local businesses are part of that. But more than that, they are a critical part of our social fabric in the sense of being in place and actually helping create place, taking space. And being, well, I look at, you know, uh, someone like Janice Lott there at Newsbeat or, you know, Rosalie Payne over at Nestware. I, I, I mean, I say them because they're, they're people I know a little bit better. I was on the parking task force. They are present there. They are creating the space that is downtown that I walk through. They're, they are merchants. They are financing it. Yeah, well, they're, they're helping to make it happen. And they're, but they're also looking out. You know, they're aware of what's going on on the street. They're yeah. aware of what's happening in the community. That's a valuable thing that extends beyond just the idea of them being in a trans... I'm, I'm not just in a transactional relationship with them. I'm in a relationship where they are a significant part of the social fabric of my community. And I think of other larger businesses, you know, uh, some that we definitely want to keep. I mean, I think, you know, Schilling Robotics or Marone, they, they've expressed a desire to stay attached to Davis. Now, will that be forever and ever? I don't know. Do, does that mean we bend over backwards and say, well, we've got to keep them, we'll do anything? No, but I do think it means that we acknowledge the value they bring to our community and we say, and we engage in an intentional conversation about what is good for you, what is good for us, can we work out a way to make this work? Because what you bring to the community is a good. What, what, what you bring in terms of jobs and opportunities, and, and even I think some of the research being done, is valuable to us. So I just wanted to say that I, I think, again, intentionality is important, but also acknowledging that we can't just create cardboard cutouts and say that's the entrepreneur, he or she is X, Y, and Z. They play a much more nuanced and, and I think valuable role they're not the whole piece. The nonprofit sector with, that I work with is another critical piece of that social fabric. Uh, but we're all part of it. And we all are working together towards what I hope is the sustainability you know, of, our, of our community and what certainly what we want to work for. So you've got a couple of minutes to close. Talk about leadership, the city manager, and the relationship with the city council as a way to end. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we're, we're a general law city. So we hire, you know, it's, it's like a lot of the boards I've been on throughout my whole career. The board, especially in a policy governance kind of environment, the board hires that key executive director, in this case the city manager, in this case the board is the city council. 
set some clear ends, and then should evaluate that person on the basis of whether they're helping to achieve the end set. Um, I mean, that in a nutshell is it. Just like in the nonprofit yeah, board, <laughs> just like the nonprofit board, that board, that city council is responsible for setting the policy guidelines. That's where the policy is set. In our case, in a, in a representative democracy, it's set through input of our commissions and our and our um, you know uh, citizens through a variety of forums. But at the end of the day, the policy is set there, and then the guidance is given to the city manager who then instructs and, and oversees staff to accomplish those ends. I have, I have a lot of questions in my mind, and it's, and, and they're, and it's out of ignorance, I'll, I'll acknowledge, about how that process of setting ends and assessing the performance of city, man city manager and city staff on the basis of whether they're achieving those, how that's actually working in our city. I can tell you my own background in, 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 as a board member and as a CEO, I think I've thought a great deal about performance evaluation. I, I've done a lot of work on, on assessing uh, progress towards goals. And so I bring, I don't just bring a perspective on economic development and those things. I bring a perspective on how we build accountability through setting clear ends and making sure that we're holding staff accountable to achieving them. And it's something that I'm really looking forward to learning more about and, if possible, improving so that we achieve greater transparency and accountability. So, why are you running? <laughs> well, it, it, you know, b based on these last 15 or 20 minutes, I would say I'm running because I think we have to be intentional about our direction at this point. We really do have to, we do have to step, I won't say step back, we have to sit down and say, what are, what's our core business right now? How are we going to pay for it? Um, that's about as far as I want to go with vision right now, but we have to deal with that. And then I'm ready to roll up my sleeves and say, all right, week to week, month to month, over the next four years, how are we going to accomplish that? And I'll be fair, and I'll listen to people, and I, and I look forward and I value the opportunity to be in a role where I can, I can help shepherd that process forward. Thanks. No, oh, thanks, John. Thanks for being on our show. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Thanks for running for office. Okay. This is Rob Davis. He's been with us talking about the problems confronting the city of Davis. This is what's going on. Thanks for being with us. Good evening.